Economics has a problem, a communications problem. In 2017, there was a survey of around 2,000 members of the British public. They said they care about economics. They care about economic issues, but they don't trust economists. They can't name economists. That is a problem we need to solve. Now, there are lots of barriers between economists and the public, but one thing that economists can do themselves is to just communicate better. Join me for a lecture where I share some of the tools and tips that economists can use to better communicate using video and film, and frankly, any media. I'm Bob Denham from Econ Films. There'll be more about me later on. So this is the five steps of an economics video. Why does good communication matter? Is it even possible to make video about economics? Uh, the five steps of an economics video. Then we're gonna have some examples, and then at the end, part five, we're gonna have some lessons. So let's make a start. Uh, imagine it's a dark and stormy night. You find an old house. Inside is a briefcase. You can open up the briefcase. And inside is an ancient book. You're gonna open up that book, and you're gonna see an essay called Politics and the English Language. And the first line you're going to read will say, most people who bother with the matter at all admit that the English language is in a bad way. It's generally assumed that we cannot do anything about it. But the process is reversible. Modern English, especially written English, is full of bad habits which spread by imitation. And it can be avoided if one is willing to take the necessary trouble. If one gets rid of these bad habits, one can think more clearly. And to think clearly is the necessary first step. This is an old ancient text you found here. You might be wondering whether it's relevant to you today. It rallies against pretentious diction. It says words like phenomenon, element, individual, objective, categorical, effective, virtual, basic, primary, promote, constitute, exhibit, exploit, utilize, eliminate, liquidate, are used to dress up a simple statement and give an air of scientific impartiality to biased judgments. I want you just to hold that thought about giving an air of scientific impartiality, dressing up simple statements to disguise biased judgments. It also rallies against foreign words and expressions, which the hundreds of phrases currently now used in the English language, again, to try and disguise what people really mean. This essay was written in 1946 by this person here. Does anyone want to guess who that person is? George Orwell. He died only four years later, but I think the words that he wrote in 1946, a year after the war, 70 odd years ago, a lifetime ago, I think they could have been written yesterday. He says that the whole tendency of modern prose, so 75 year old English language, is away from concreteness. I think that could be very true today when you hear a lot of people talk in the media. The attraction of this way of writing is that it is easy. It is easier, even quicker, once you have the habit to say, in my opinion, it is not an unjustifiable assumption that, rather than just to say, I think. And because of that, if you use simple English, when you make a stupid remark, its stupidity will be obvious even to you. If you dress it up with lots of jargon and foreign words and try to make it sound more profound, if you're only doing the boiled down version, it'll become clear if it's illogical, much clearer to you. This is a section from a very, very popular book that's had a lot of influence, uh, otherwise known as the Bible. Um, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favour to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. This is it in modern English. Objective considerations of contemporary phenomena compel the conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. When you read economics articles or hear economists speak, which one of these two examples 
do you come across more often? Second one. So uh, George Orwell came up with six rules. Could I get a volunteer to read out the first rule, please? Never use a metaphor, simile, or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. Never use a long word where a short one will do. If it is possible to cut a word out, always cut it out. Never use the passive where you can use the active. Great. Now, does everyone know what this means? The difference between passive and active. The economy is negatively affected by the high tax rate. Passive. High taxes are damaging the economy. Active. Never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word, or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. How many times do you see this in economics where you think an everyday English equivalent could be used? All the time. Something to bear in mind because we'll come to that a little bit later. Break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. That's George Orwell being a bit flamboyant. Decades later, it's the same old story. I'm going to show you a very quick video. And American English is loaded with euphemisms because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent a kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. And it gets worse with every generation. For some reason, it just keeps getting worse. I'll give you an example of that. There's a condition in combat. Most people know about it. It's when a fighting person's nervous system has been stressed to its absolute peak and maximum, can't take any more input. The nervous system has either snapped or is about to snap. In the First World War, that condition was called shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language, two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was 70 years ago. Then a whole generation went by, and the Second World War came along, and we, the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. Then we had the war in Korea in 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high by that time. And the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. <laughs> hey, we're up to eight syllables now. And the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's totally sterile now. Operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. Then, of course, came the war in Vietnam, which has only been over for about 16 or 17 years. And thanks to the lies and deceit surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen. <laughs> and the pain is completely buried under jargon. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll bet you, if we'd have still been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have gotten the attention they needed at the time. I'll bet you that. I'll bet you that. Now let's turn to modern day economists and their rules are. Greg Bankew is and was for many years the teacher of Econ 101 at Harvard. He was an advisor to the Bush government on their chair of economic advisors. He also is the author of the best-selling economics textbook. His rules for how to um, write and communicate economics. Keep sentences short. Short words are better than long words. Monosyllabic words are best. Avoid jargon. Any word you don't read regularly in a newspaper is suspect. Avoid unnecessary words. For instance, in most cases, change in order to, to, to whether or not, to whether <laughs> is equal to, to equals. Avoid, of course, clearly and obviously. Clearly, if something is obvious, that fact will, of course, be obvious to the reader. Keep your writing personal. Remind readers how economics affects their lives. So, the problems of communication are nothing new. Thankfully, the ideas behind good communication are not new either. They're actually quite easy to grasp. The much harder thing is how to apply them. And that's what we look into in the next lectures. Mm -hmm.